So now it is my pleasure to introduce Asma Ayab. She, she holds a master's degree in dramatic art and a PhD in, philosophy, in literature and philosophy. She has lectured at Mercy College, Fordham University, and the State University of New York. And now she is the author of the book, Understanding Bollywood, A Calling. Welcome, Asma. Thank you, Joan. Um, I'm so grateful for the invitation and for all that you did to put this event together. And I'm really, it is really a privilege and a pleasure to be here today. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you all for being here. I will be discussing my latest book, Understanding Bollywood, A Calling. Um, this is a copy of the book. This book was inspired by my research and my doctoral thesis, which is entitled Beyond Appearance, Transnationalism and the Representation of Women in Bollywood Cinema. Personally, I am very passionate about the performing arts and I'm equally passionate about the need to engage in discussion about what we see on screen. Whenever I lecture on film, I encourage my students to analyze film through various lenses. I believe that this leads to learning about different societies and cultures in the constantly evolving world that we live in. And on that note, without further ado, let's talk Bollywood. Okay, so I'd like to start by giving you a brief overview of the structure of the book. I'll be focusing on the five core chapters of my book, beginning with the steady rise of Bollywood. Under this heading, I discuss the origins and then the steady rise of Bollywood from a cinema that catered primarily for its native audience to a cinema that perpetuated ideologies of Indian nationalism through its storylines. And lastly, to a cinema that has evolved over time and become a global phenomenon. Secondly, this book focuses on the representation and reshaping of women in Bollywood films and how this has changed over the years. This includes the historiography of women in India, as well as the challenges they encountered because of patriarchy and other nationalist ideals that they were expected to uphold. This chapter also examines the reception of all women across the globe, regardless of their heritage. Thirdly, my book looks at liberalization, transnationalism, and globalization. Now, when talking about liberalization, I am referring to the period post-1991, when India became economically liberated. During this period, emerging global markets opened up as an avenue for increased revenue for the Bollywood industry. According to statistics in both the US and UK, post-1991, Bollywood films often appear in the, box, in the top box office charts as the most popular foreign language films. It is interesting too that Hollywood and Bollywood continue to work together and are working together more as time goes on. In 2009, Australian singer Kylie Minogue made an appearance with Bollywood actor Akshay Kumar in the film Blue. In the same year, Sylvester Stallone appeared in the Bollywood film Kambak Ish. We also see glimpses of seasoned actor Anupam Kher in the Oscar winning film Silver Linings Playbook and the American medical drama series, New Amsterdam. With time, it seems as though the lines between Hollywood and Bollywood are blurring. But for Indian migrants, it is transnationalism that is important because this allows for a space to be created between the older ideologies of India and the formation of a new Indian identity away from the homeland. Going forward, I will use the terms liberalization, transnationalism, and globalization interchangeably in the discussion that is related to the period when Bollywood filtered into the global arena 
and became a significant cinema for the Indian diaspora. Through migration, Indian people moved into countries across the globe. And as a result, there was an intermingling of cultures and with that, um, societal views, beliefs and traditions began to integrate with various traditions and in other cultures. This globalization in turn led to an awareness of Bollywood films and the talent that existed within this culture. But at the same time, the subordination of women within Bollywood films was highlighted. Uh, looking at this from a feminist perspective, I linked the subordination of Indian women with the idea of subordination of women in Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique. In this book, she voices the frustrations of millions of American women um, who are grappling with their limited gender roles. The crucial difference of this representation though, is that older Bollywood films are well known for glorifying or might I say, almost romanticizing the idea of subordination as a quality to be revered. However, from as early as the 1900s, Bollywood filmmakers have been vested in reshaping women on screen. Even though films that glorified the suffering of women were still being made and are still often made, there has been a shift. And today, it is the films that cater for the emerging diasporic markets that initiate a new reality. These findings are discussed in depth in the chapter titled Song and Dance in Bollywood. Now, one of the main themes of this chapter deals with the criticism garnered against the Bollywood industry for objectifying women on screen. Lastly, a discussion centered around the representation of tradition and culture in Bollywood is explored through the chapter entitled The Dream Team. This partnership or collaboration is made up of well-renowned actor Shah Rukh Khan and the New Age director uh, writer-director Karan Jaw. When you read this book, you will get an understanding of Bollywood from a historical perspective, as well as the impact it has on women, society, and culture. But more importantly, you will come to understand how all these issues have been integrated into the narratives of Bollywood films and how countries that don't even understand the language of Bollywood or can or people who are not even familiar with Indian culture are appreciating films such as these. Perhaps it is because at the end of the day, women and society are universal concepts. I'd like to tell you a little bit about my personal journey into this field. Okay. My first encounter with Bollywood happened in 1980. I was 14 years old and I just finished reading Daniel Steele's The Promise. During that same year, Bollywood released a film called Yevada Raha. Loosely translated, this means this promise. I lived with my extended family at the time and this included my grandmother who did not speak a word of English. So her only connection to a beloved India at the time was through Hindi language films, which today have popularly become known as Bollywood films. So once a week, our entire family would gather around a little square box. Oh yes, no streaming, no flat screen TVs. Anyway, my mother would make these delicious, in my grandmother would make these delicious Indian treats and we would settle down for a good two to three hours to watch the films. I must be honest with you, Bollywood did not appeal to me at the time. For me, it was solely the connection that the film made with Steele's text that drew me into the film. But for my grandmother and other members of my family who were forced to flee India, it was a connection with their past, their home, their interrupted legacy. I remember watching certain Bollywood films over and over again. 
sometimes falling in love with the spectacle, the dances, the catchy tunes, but I soon lost interest. I found that all the films had the same elements, romance, a ton of melodrama, lengthy comedic scenes and tragedy. And of course, punches were always thrown in the mix. And then when least expected, the hero and heroine would jump up and run around trees, singing and dancing as though the world were a utopia. Little did I know at the time, but this bumbling mixture that I have just described is what defines the Bollywood masala film. Years later, when I began my study on Bollywood cinema, I was driven by the dream team. And for me, this is the collaboration or the formidable duo of Shah Rukh Khan and Karan Jor. Uh, Karan Jor is on the left, Shah Rukh Khan is on the right. This is the actor and director who I believe have changed the face of Bollywood. So while studying the representational techniques employed by Johar in his three blockbuster films, uh, Kabi Khushi Kabi Gam, Kuch Kuch Hota Hai, and Kabi Alvida Na Kehna, I was quite impressed by the way he framed the challenges faced by Indian women in a changing world. The three films that you see on screen uh, can be loosely translated at, and I will begin with the first film on the left, Kabi Khushi Kabi Gam, it means sometimes happiness, sometimes sadness. The one in the middle, kuch kuch hota hai, translates as some things happen. And the one on the right, kabi alvida na kehna, means never say goodbye. You should know that the notion of identity is the central focus of my work. When analyzing George's films, I always appreciate the nuances of culture that he portrays in his films. Being of Indian descent, I'm especially grateful for his unique discerning representations of identity because they murder the constant chasm that I, also a woman of the diaspora, experience in various aspects of my life. But identity can be as simple as it is complicated. I was born in a small town in South Africa but then grew up between South Africa and New York. My home environment, on the other hand, whether it was in the US or Africa, has been packed with Indian ideologies because my entire extended family are descendants of India. And I'm still looking for home. But in the meanwhile, I have engaged at great length with contemporary diasporic films. One film that really resonates with me on many levels is a film called Pardes. That's the film you see in the slide on the left. Um, it loosely translates as foreign land. It is directed by Subhash Ghai. It is set in America and India and deals with an Indian patriot's dream to find his Western son an Indian bride. And so he goes in pursuit of this Indian bride from America back to India. Um, I will not elaborate more because I hope that you get an opportunity to watch this film. It really is a very interesting film. And as noted by scholars, it really does capture the various sensibilities that diasporic people experience when they move away from their native land, such as displacement, um, new beginnings, and of course, issues of belonging and alienation. Um, films such as Pardes uh, carry a very important theme and they step away from usual Bollywood representations uh, in terms of the way in which the West is perceived. In older Bollywood films, the West would almost always be illustrated in a negative light, while the purity and value systems of the East would be glorified. 
but firms such as Pardes have initiated a new type of representation that is not black and white anymore um, as it was in the past. And so there is room for analysis, negotiation, lots of dialogue. And what happens is that the West and East do become conflated at various points in the firm. Uh, and I, I believe what this does is highlights um, the notion that difference is really a man-made construct. If you look at the slide on the right, you will see uh, the firm called My Name is Khan. This is another Bollywood film that addresses the trajectory of the Indian diaspora as they encounter the West. This film was also shot in various locations in the United States. And again, the key characters are members of the diaspora, Indian diaspora. Literature and research illustrate how films specializing in representations of the Indian diaspora have been very instrumental in bringing Bollywood into the global arena and talking to audiences about the challenges and experiences that they experience as diasporic members of society. Let's take a moment and talk about the diaspora. The word diaspora is derived from the Greek word meaning to disperse. Very simply, as Indians moved away from India, they became part of other cultural groups where sharing of ideas, traditions, and often rituals took place. And as far as affiliation to their genealogy, research reveals that the Indian diaspora's imagination of India is strongly informed by Bollywood. So as you can see, according to Bandhya Padai, he distinguishes between three generations of the Indian diaspora and the manner in which they perceive India after watching Bollywood films. So according to this theory, the first generations of India of Indians want to travel to India as a result of the nostalgia that they experience when watching Bollywood movies. The motivation for second generation Indians is to experience the modern India that is depicted in so many Bollywood films. Finally, the third generation of Indians who have no links to India that is those who were born outside of India to Indian families, uh, these, these members of the diaspora motivated to, in, to visit India, to visit the India that is romanticized in Bollywood movies. As for me, I identify with all three generations above. I am a third generation member of the Indian diaspora, but after watching Bollywood films, I longed to visit India and that's the honest truth. And as for the motivation of second generations, I too was extremely curious to visit the India that we see on screen, the glossed over India, the India that is romanticized in so many contemporary Bollywood films. But coming back to my reality, except for being, ex for being an ex exotic locale on my bucket, bucket list, I have no physical links to India. So moving on, in order to gain a real understanding of Bollywood, it is essential to go back to, to its origins. And those of you who are familiar with Bollywood will know that Bollywood films provide a fascinating account of Indian history and cultural politics. In light of the statement, it is important to note that the content of older Bollywood films was derived from diverse Indian sources, such as Parsi theater and Hindu mythology. Now going back to the roots of Bollywood cinema, um, older Bollywood films did draw inspiration from Parsi theater and Hindu mythology. Um, many, Bollywood films to this day are influenced by over the top performances. And if you look at this slide over here, 
um, since Parsi theater was largely influenced by mid-Victorian stage conventions, their sets included painted scenarios, elaborate costumes, and thick and mask-like makeup. In terms of performance aesthetics, when you look at this slide here, um, there were over-the-top performances, there were exaggerated scenarios, and as I've discussed earlier, this was how the Masala film came to be. You should also know that Parsi theater performances were generally very long. Um, they often started at 11 or 12 at night. They went on through the night, past dawn. Uh, they drew from highly mixed repertoires such as Sanskrit epics, Shakespeare, the tales of the Arabian Nights, and even local legend and history. Of course, all of these inspirations were adapted for the tastes of the local audiences for which they were being performed. And since theatrical, theatrical conventions of the times encouraged the display of over-the-top performances, Parsi theater was successful and became a thoroughly commercial affair. And drawing from the conventions of this theater form, Bollywood films, as I've explained, displayed similar representations. But while Parsi theater was successful, the films that were based on this theater form were harshly criticized by scholars. Aside from being lambasted as mere spectacles, Bollywood films were criticized for being poor imitations of art that lacked social realism. And for a very, very long time, Bollywood films were ignored within the context of first world culture and society. But scholars uh, about Bollywood filmmakers responded to these challenges and over time, um, due to various political challenges, as well as other contexts, Bollywood cinema evolved. So in the early 1990s, a spate of films focusing on the Indian diaspora were released. You've seen the first one in a slide earlier, Kuch Kuch Hota Hai, which um, of course translates as something's happened. The film in the middle is Dilwale Dulhaniya Le Jayenge. Um, it is well known as DDLJ. A lot of these films were abbreviated and this was the reason behind this was also so that they could appeal to um, new generations of the diaspora, younger generations, uh, those who did not speak Hindi language. So instead of having to say, Dilwale Dulhanya Le Jayenge, a friend would say to another friend, hey, let's go and see DDLJ. Or when it comes to the other movie, uh, Kabi Alvida Na Kehna, that movie has been labeled as K3G. And so this made it easier for communication and for the language of Bollywood to filter into the circles of the younger generation. So um, translating again, getting back to the translations, Dilwale Dulhanya Le Jayenge translates as, the brave hearted will claim their brides, and the film on the far right uh, called Dilto Pagal here translates as the heart is crazy. It's interesting that according to a poll in Newsweek, these films increased the revenue of India's movie exports from 10 million to $100 million within the span of a decade. And this film, which I have blown up now for this next, uh, in the next slide, is really, has really become one of the most iconic Bollywood films that broke through much of the criticism. I will refer to it as DDLJ going forward. And one of the reasons that this film is important is because in the midst of much criticism against Bollywood and its films, its narrative structures, and various other issues, DDLJ resonated exceptionally well with audiences, not only in India, but abroad as well. 
It is also hailed as the longest running film in the history of Indian cinema. So very briefly, DDLJ is a family-centered feel-good film. It is a romantic story set in India and London, and it has since become the cultural icon of a globalizing India. It is well known for its representations that allow the audience to rethink older normative thought, process, thought patterns. The success of Bollywood films such as these can be attributed to the fact that they represent real slices of life, especially when it comes to issues that affect the Indian diaspora. This brings me to an ongoing argument in relation to representation and um, views on film and that is the male gaze. The media constantly intimates that Bollywood filmmakers should refrain from objectifying women through representations in item numbers. Let me unpack this for you um, in order to simplify it a little bit. If you look at these two pictures over here, um, you see the woman on the left who is considered an epitome of all that must be glorified. Her gaze is lowered. She wears a traditional Indian dress. The woman on the right, however, is considered a vamp who is an outsider to pure Indian values because she's hypersexualized through modern clothing and dances explicitly for the benefit of the male gaze. Now, while the picture on the left represents um, an acceptable attire and demeanor of a quintessential Indian woman, the picture on the right is the one that will attract criticism. The employment of eye candy is a contentious point in film theory and criticism. It is also an issue that is especially highlighted whenever acts of violence are committed against women. This was the case when a heinous crime was committed in 2012. I was immersed in my research when an unthinkable tragedy occurred in December 2012 in Delhi. A young woman was gang raped on a moving bus and based on the close relationship between Bollywood films and Indian society, Bollywood filmmakers were accused of playing a contributory role in fueling the rape culture in India. Due to the wide media coverage of this incident and international dialogue on both the issue of rape as well as the general treatment of women in India was reignited. Subsequently, the Wall Street Journal cited Bollywood as playing a contributory role in fueling the culture of rape in India. Now, if you think of popular Bollywood films today, suggestive lyrics, gyrating moves, pelvic thrusts, and figure hung hugging skimpy outfits are the unique selling points of various song and dance sequences. Um, and you can see in this picture over here that deals with item numbers, these song and dance sequences are really specifically focused on the movements of the heroine as they perform solely for the male gaze, not only in the film, but for audiences who are watching the films as outsiders. Subsequently, based on the rape case, Canadian film director Richie Mehta wrote and directed a documentary called Delhi Crime. This was released on Netflix and won an international Emmy for best drama series in 2019. As a result of all the media exposure 
an international dialogue was initiated. This heinous crime ignited a worldwide frenzy. Activists and celebrities from all over the world joined the international dialogue on this incident. Bollywood actress Shabana Azmi joined the conversation and highlighted the complexity of issues that plague the country aside from Bollywood, such as socio-political factors, poverty, internalized patriarchal mindsets, and high illiteracy levels. American activist Eve, Bl Eve Ensler, on the other hand, branded the incident a catalytic, catalytic moment that should be used to rethink the degradation of women globally. Now, being able to witness this traffic tragic event while writing my thesis and witnessing the international response and criticism of Bollywood on a global scale allowed me to delve further into the impact of Bollywood, both positive and negative, some of which is beyond the scope of this presentation, but can be found in my book. Bollywood cinema, now that it is a player on a global platform, needs to be assessed through a global lens. And it has been established that Bollywood cinema has been a carrier of nationalist and patriotic themes. Um, it has played a very important role in constructing and defining dichotomies such as tradition and modernity, Indian and Western, spiritual and material. But if we take this a step further, and if we look at this through a global lens, then we will be able to understand that Bollywood Hollywood, Broadway, the ballet, the opera, and even individual artists express themselves through song and dance in various forms. Broadway has staged musicals such as Chicago, Moulin Rouge, and the Phantom of the Opera to name a few. And these musicals were then adapted into lucrative Hollywood films. Music and dance are art forms practiced by those who love their craft and who attempt to share their unique forms of expression with the world. But music and dance can also be healing. And I believe that both filmmakers and audiences need to be aware, need to be consciously aware of the cultural implications of film. We live in a world that thrives on expression, especially when it comes to the performing arts. And so to bring everything I've said into focus, I would like to summarize by saying that my research focuses on identity, loss, displacement, and the idea of finding some sense of belonging in the world that we live in. Of course, we must acknowledge that the world has turned into a huge melting pot with the increase of migration, with the increase of technology, or even the desire to search for greener pastures. But then there's also the issue of forced evacuation and fleeing, which is an ongoing reality of wars that continue to fester in our world. This will create a new diaspora, or should I say, generations of diaspora. And they will all look for belonging. They will struggle with issues of loss and displacement. But nevertheless, the world will continue to turn. As an academic, I'm constantly curious. And in order to make sense of issues, I use Bollywood films as a backdrop to understand and explain how films can and are very often used as educational tools to teach and inform not only students, but societies as well. I believe Bollywood films can be used to reflect on societies, their cultural practices, 
and many other issues that affect real people. Understanding Bollywood a calling is therefore both relevant and necessary during the times that we live in. Thank you. And on that note, Joan, um, if, yes. you, if you are ready, I would like to open it up to well, questions. First, I have to comment um, that I didn't know exactly what you were going to talk about, mm -hmm. but I am so thrilled the way you pulled this all together and where you went with the whole, the whole uh, Bollywood, um, the Bollywood films, the tie-in with, with, with Hollywood and how you brought it up to date with all the globalization uh, and all those things that you brought in. I can't remember them all right now, but how you brought this all together gives us a lot of food for thought. It was a really wonderful, wonderful presentation. And I can't even imagine how much research you did on this book. Uh, I would <laughs> like to ask that question when we open it up. Um, because my only... Um, uh, opportunity to see any uh, film about India was an American made film called The Mistress of Spice. Okay. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen that film. Yes, it I have. It took place in America, but it was about an Indian woman selling spices. Yes. And I guess it was, <laughs> it was made for the American uh, audience. Yes. But it was an, um, it was really, uh, I love the film, but bringing this what you just described and you brought our attention to was really a wonderful thing. Thank you so much for this. Thank so you. I do, I, I do want to open this up for everybody. If you would just take your um, screen share and stop it. Okay. That would be very helpful. There we go. Excellent. Okay. Um, so if anybody wants to uh, ask a question, please type it in the chat function. But while you're doing this, I just want to ask how, how long did you research? I, you said, you know, you began with your thesis and whatnot. How long did you work on this book? Um, well, this book I worked on after I, I finished my doctoral thesis, which was around 2014. Um, I had ideas, it was not really you know, coming to fruition, but uh, I realized that, you know, time, the world is constantly changing. And from the time that I completed my thesis to the time that I was ready to write the book, there was so much more research out there already. So it's like I keep going back to the drawing board and looking at the new ideas that are developing. Um, I follow conversations that are happening with regard to Bollywood the criticisms, uh, you know, and so forth. So it took a couple of years after the, the thesis, because, you know, the thesis is really very structured. Um, the book is, of course, deviation, as you know, from the thesis. So it's, it's lighter reading. Um, so to unpack that, I think, uh, for me, the challenge was really trying to unpack theories and issues so that everyone can understand you know, where mm -hmm. I'm coming from, because there is such a plethora of research out there. Um, yeah. And it's just increasing, you know. Yeah, yes, 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 yes. Um, uh, I belong to a book group, and we've already written, uh, read books that take place in Mumbai, and at least three books we've had now. And so this was very relevant, this whole, <laughs> I'm very thrilled about this. It was really good. Uh, but I'm a little curious. I know we haven't gotten a type question yet. Um, uh, you, you will go back to India? I mean, you, you haven't been there, right? But I have, have actually. Plans? I oh. went back to India, um, and was this, was before, this was before I, I, I did my thesis. I was busy with my, with my thesis, and of course, um, I went with my family to India. Uh, I went to the place where my ancestors uh, were living before the partition happened in 1947. Um, it was just before then that my extended family members left India to get away from all of that. 
And so um, I visited it and although I identified with a lot of the culture, the dress, the food, um, it was very far removed from my experiences in uh, uh, South Africa, did you say? Is that where uh, you were living? Yes, in South Africa and, and my experiences in your Sean, I must just tell you that it says on my screen that the chat is disabled. So is that probably? really? Yes, we're not getting any questions. No, no, I don't have that on my screen. Anybody could type. I don't have to disable it or make it. It's oh, just okay. so then always maybe, there. Maybe just my screen. I guess you were so thorough that nobody is, is I mean, that happens more often than you would believe. Really? Uh, although somebody raised their hand right now. Okay. Um, let me, um, that's a little different. I just didn't want to do it. I have to find out who it was. Hold it. I'm sorry, but I can't, if you would type your question in, I'm not getting it on my screen, who raised their hand, which is when I would allow you to talk. Oh, I'm sorry, maybe if I got it by the name of the person who raised their hand. Um, if somebody, I, I don't know who raised their hand and usually it pops up on my screen and then I just hit a button. I'm sorry, I don't have that person's. Oh, here we go. Got it now. I guess it takes a while to come over. Allow to talk. Yeah, this is Samira. Okay. Samira, you, you, you're you uh, muted. So if you want to talk, you, okay, there you go. Hey, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you so much for that um, informative uh, piece and uh, presentation. I was quite, um, um, intrigued by what you spoke. As a lecturer in psychology, I must say that I would like to use a book of this caliber for research purposes for the reason that when we train students, we often need to speak to them about the different cultures and upbringing and the lenses that you speak about where a person needs to look at a certain family and the dynamic within. So having this book on hand, I think it's an excellent tool to use in universities to teach and enable students to appreciate the different cultures out there and for them to resonate with what diversity actually means. So I must say thank you so much for this uh, wonderful book and how you've put it together. I have had the opportunity to read it and I must say that um, I'm a PhD myself, so thesis writing can be quite overwhelming. And for you to actually take that and immerse it into a book that is a couple of hundred pages, but very informative, absolutely well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yes, that was wonderful. Um, there was somebody else, but they, I think they, they lowered their hand or I haven't gotten it. Um, yes, I mean, I think you want to mention about your book. Did you want to give everybody the website or the email and yes, how to get to purchase the book? Up. Let me put that up. Uh, just bear with me a second. Okay. Okay, so there's, okay. Uh, there's some information on the book. Um, you can order it from Cambridge Scholars, uh, there's a discount code, you get 25% off and uh, it's quite an easy process. I just wanna to mention to everybody that this program has been videotaped, which means it will uh, appear on our website probably in about a week. If you go to our website, chapacallibrary.org and, and scroll down, you'll see a screen and most likely this program will be running. So if you want to share this program with somebody and if they're interested in purchasing the book, just go through the program and you'll, the film, and you'll see the entire uh, uh, discussion and then you could purchase the book. So um, it's very helpful that way because this is being, as I told Asma, this goes viral sometimes. We get a lot of uh, hits on our program. So 
I'm just encouraging everybody to share it with friends mm -hmm. or to um, go to a website to, to see it again. So I think that's just about it. Whoever raised their hand has put their hand down. <laughs> so anybody have any more questions, want to type it in chat function or to raise their hand and talk? No? This was really, Aspen, you did an amazing job presenting this. I thank you so much. And um, I welcome any, um, any more questions, anything from anybody? Thank you again very much. So I wish everybody a good weekend and um, stay safe and uh, purchase uh, Bollywood, a call, understanding Bollywood, a calling. All right. Thank you, Joan. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Our pleasure. Thank you all for coming and um, I hope to see you in the library.